Hello, everybody. Welcome to the Rambling Runoff Sports Podcast. I am your host, as always, Robert Rios. And I'd just like to say Happy New Year. Happy 2022 to everybody out there in the world right now listening to our podcast. It was a wild 2021 and even wilder 2020. But hey, if you're listening to this in good health, good on you. Welcome back to the show. Once again, I'm Robert Ruiz, your host. We're a sports podcast, Rambling Runoff. If this is your first time listening, thank you so much for finding us. But yes, yes, we are back. I know our usual youth listeners, we were off for those two weeks. Like I I think I had said we were going to record, but scheduling conflicts just didn't pan out. And scheduling is a little hard during the holidays, especially for me and my host. So, you know, like I had already also mentioned prior, hey, we're probably going to take those two weeks off anyway. But it doesn't matter. We're here now. It's the first official week of 2022. So, you know, we had to make sure we had to put out an episode here. So sit back, relax. If you're in a vehicle, make sure you have your seatbelt on and you have two hands on the steering wheel and the volume is at a constant volume for you so you can concentrate. And we'll get the show going. But uh, first off, if you haven't noticed, our casual listener, our regular listeners, um, it's just me today. Uh, there's no Danny Tan, there's no Daniel Tom. Uh, everyone's kind of schedules got all mixed up, and I was the only one available. So yeah, this is how we're starting off 2022. We're gonna start off strong individually, and yeah, let's do the damn thing. So on today's show, we are going to be talking about a lot of football, tackle football. American football, America. So we got some college football. We had the New Year's Six Bowl games that just passed by. Uh, the NFL is about to go into this playoff, so we're going to give a little bit of, of, I guess, my opinions and what I think about the NFL and what's going on there. And then, um, although it's just me, I, I guess I'm, I mean, I was going to do this anyway, with or without a host. We're going to do uh, something a little different for the warm-up. It's our own little section where we just like talk about the, smaller thing in the sports world but in this case we're going to do something specifically different as in i'm going to talk about a sports topic but it's going to be my favorite holiday slash winter break sports moments which i have a few which i remember from my childhood so i just want to go through that and then in the rundown we got a lot of good stuff so stick around towards the end to hear what sports news is going around so yes yes it should be a a decent show i mean this was this, like my second time doing a solo dolo show so wish me luck and yeah and if you're wondering i did have an okay christmas and an okay new year's i hope you guys had a very jolly christmas and an excellent new year's so yeah wish us luck for 2022 so first off uh like i mentioned in our my little short preview a couple of seconds ago we're gonna do some college football the six they had the the New Year's Six Bowl games, which were interesting. Um, just to start off, none of my predictions came through came true, which I'm kind of disappointed. But it's okay, it's okay. And I got them listed here. We had the Peach Bowl, we had the Cotton Bowl, the Class Cotton Bowl Classic, excuse me. We had the Orange Bowl, Fiesta Bowl, the Rose Bowl, the Sugar Bowl, and they're all pretty good games. Uh, on December 30th, that Thursday, we had the Peach Bowl which included Michigan State versus Pittsburgh. Um, <laughs> uh, I don't think no one really cared about this game. Uh, Pitts, the, the QB Pittsburgh, the QB for Pittsburgh, I'm forgetting his name off the top of my head. Up. Maybe if they didn't ban that, that sliding rule, maybe they would have won. But unfortunately, it was not their day as Michigan State, the number 10 team in the country, defeated the number 12 team in the country, Pittsburgh, by a score of 31 to 21 by 10 points out in their Atlanta, Georgia at the Peach Bowl. And then going on along through uh, the numeric schedule of the games, uh, we had the college football semifinals, which were on New Year's Eve, December 31st, on that Friday, uh, out there in Arlington in the Cotton Bowl Classic, Alabama defeated Cincinnati 27 to 6. After that, out there in Miami Gardens, Florida at the Orange Bowl, Georgia defeated Michigan by a score of 34 to 11. And then the next day, New Year's Day, January 1st, at the Fiesta Bowl in Glenda, Arizona. Uh, the number one, number nine team, Oklahoma State, defeated the number five team in the country, Notre Dame, by a score of 37 to 35. 
Also on that day was the Rose Bowl, which is I was I was able luckily to catch some of it. Ohio State defeated defeated the Utah Utes forty eight to forty five in the Sugar Bowl and down there in New Orleans. Number seven Baylor defeated Ole Miss twenty one to seven. So I mean, you read the scoreline; some of them were close, some of them were a little bit off. But overall, I think the games were pretty good, considering that the two main games were kind of duds. So it's not like we got, I guess you could say, a split of good games and another split of bad games, which is okay, I guess. Here, though, I'm pretty sure any casual person that would turn on their television would be like, whoa, this team that's got their ass kicked, why am I going to watch it for? But it's okay. And um, since it's just me, I'm talking to the air and our, our listeners hearing this later on. Did any of you guys get to watch any of the games? And if you did, uh, let us know on Twitter at Off Rounding, which one did you like? So I guess uh, I should probably dive into more about the games in which I'll do in a, in a couple in a little bit. But uh, I think overall the college football season was pretty pretty decent. Uh, I, I think I think I already said in a past show that we had a good mix of teams going up and down the college football rankings, so it wasn't just like a one team race because those seasons are, are are pretty boring, considering like Alabama's been on top for so long that it gets kind of stale to see them win all the time and you know you you want them to lose but you know it just never pans out because well they have really good teams and what are you gonna do (laughs) they're just gonna run you over each time especially not even just alabama just the sec in general so yeah (laughs) So I guess it's time to go into some of these games a little, with a little more detail. And uh, I'm not going to go over all of them, but the ones that caught my eye, uh, specifically the first one, in order, I believe. Did I do this in order? No, I did not. Why did I do it in order? But anyways, um, the Fiesta Bowl with Oklahoma State and Notre Dame. That was an interesting game considering Notre Dame was up big throughout most of the game. I mean, spoiler alert, they blew it. They were up 28-7. to seven. It looked like oh, Oklahoma State was down and out. But somehow, some way, this team found a way to, you know, come back and, you know, defeat the Fighting Irish. So in the second half, the first half was all Notre Dame. I think there was a, a picture floating around one of the players, you know, just chilling. You know, it was a smile. And in the second half, once Oklahoma guy Oklahoma State got it together, <laughs> they showed the guy, oh man, poor dude, sitting in the same spot with his head down. Like, dude, how the hell did we even get here? Like, how does this happen? But hey, man, that's college football. What are you gonna do? Because yeah, um, I guess you could say the turn of the game happened right at the beginning of the fourth quarter, where Notre Dame was trying to gain momentum. They're past the 50-yard line, trying to do a run play, and bam, fumble, fumble the ball, which killed all their momentum. And what are you going to do in 15 minutes when the other team has the ball? And even had a second chance. But like I said, that play, that one fumble play in the beginning of the fourth killed it for them, and they were never going to recover. And I guess just give them more detail. Yeah, fourth quarter, it was all American safety. Uh, Kobe Harvell Peel crashed in to make the stop on the North, on the North Dame freshman running back Logan Diggs. Stripped the ball free right before he, he was brought to the ground. So, what you gonna do? He he stopped you. He he single handedly destroyed the team. How many players can say they done that? And after that, yeah, there was nothing else that the team could do because they were just a way better team. Overall, and the funny thing too is that like it wasn't just that the Cowboys' defense was better in the second half. It's like this whole Notre Dame offense just had a, a breakdown. Uh, oh, what's this guy's name? Coan, the quarterback for Notre Dame. Coan Cone. He had three hundred forty-two yards and four touchdowns in the first half. You know. 
that's already good numbers to, against any team. But, you know, going into the third, he only had 40 passing yards. But also just note that he had 509 yards overall in the game. And that that's a record in the, in the bowl. It's like, how are you how are you breaking records and you still lose? So, I mean, it's just, it makes no sense is, if, is what I'm trying to say. But hey, it's Notre Dame. They they usually try to get to the, they usually get to the big games and virtually choke it every single time. Like there was that one year where they made it to the college football playoffs and everyone basically was like, "Yeah, they're not going to win it. They're playing Alabama." Like Alabama was never going to lose that game. And guess what? They lost. Yeah, that's the best way I could summarize it for Notre Dame. Like, all right, you guys are good, but you're not going to you're not going to do a good job. So why should we care? I, actually, I don't know why people wouldn't care in general of this team, now that I think about it. If you're going to go out there, get a big lead, and just relax it, or let the other team get the, the upper hand, then what the hell are you guys doing? But anyways, it's Notre Dame. Notre Dame's going to Notre Dame. And I, I think people should start noticing that. Because, yeah, they play good in the regular season, but just flounder in these big bowl games. So, better luck next time. Let's see what else we got here. Ah, my favorite. A classic, a true classic bowl game. The Rose Bowl, which included the Utah Utes and Ohio State Buckeyes. What was the scoreline for this game? Let me look at my notes. Yeah, Ohio State 48, Utah 45. Now, this was actually a really good bowl game because, yeah, the, the scoreline reads it was close because it was close. It was close the whole time. And damn, they they played their hearts out at this game. Uh, one of the the main highlights of the game that was just ringing up all on Twitter and Instagram was a how do I say this dude's name? Smith. I'm not even gonna try the other part. <laughs> I'm historically known on mispronouncing names, but Mr. Smith set the record for any SBS bowl game with 345 yards receiving while catching a school record of 15 passes and scoring three touchdowns in the game. <sighs> and alongside that, Marvin Harris Jr. caught three TD passes for the Buckeyes, who set a Rose Bowl and school record with 683 total yards. And hey, that QB they got, C.J. Stroud, he threw for 573 yards and six touchdowns. Bro. 347 yards receiving for Smith makes regular people tired. Like, people that would run that would would die. Like, that's how insane this game was because they, they had to. You know, Utah, I, there's that play they had in the back of the end zone, the tippy-toe play where they caught that pass. You know, when you have a team – pulling out all the stops, you you have to go for it all. And I feel like that's what Ohio State did, considering they had they, they won the game off of a last-second field goal, basically, which is why I also failed to mention. Sorry, everybody. It's hard to do this talking to myself. But good on them that they were able to, you know, bounce back, I guess, after the past couple of years. Because I know – I remember I spoke with Daniel Tom about this. Like, whatever happened to Ohio State? Because I would tell him, like, well, I haven't heard much from them. But guess after Urban Meyer left, they kind of just slowly backpedaled out of the spotlight. But, no, I, they came into the Rose Bowl, the granddaddy of them all. And they, they beat a, a decent Utah team, considering everyone thought UCLA or I guess USC would be in this position. Or actually, no, UCLA or Oregon. Nah, I'm sorry. I'm a USC lover. Excuse me. But yeah, USC or, or UCLA or Oregon was going to be in this game against whoever and then beat them. But no, they did not. And said so we had the Buckeyes, which if you guys don't know, a Buckeye is like a nut and it's shaped like an eye. That's why they're called the Buckeyes. And they have that weird-looking mascot. But you guys didn't know that. But yeah. Ohio State, you know, they did what they had to do. 
and they got the dub. Just to give you guys, yeah, the score line. The score line was a little bit weird though, even though it was close, because Utah in the first quarter went out 14 0, and the second, in the second, um, Ohio State scored 21, then they scored 10 in the third. Utah only scored, got the field goal in the third. And then in the fourth, Ohio State scored 17 to Utah 7 in the fourth quarter. So I guess you could say, yeah, it was a, similar to the Notre Dame game. Notre Dame Oklahoma State game where the first team was dominant in the first half and the second team obviously was dominant in the second half but I mean it's not like it was a slaughter on both sides because both teams were you know they were getting points on the board every time they had the ball mostly so good on them because I guess you could say the game for Utah slipped away yeah in the fourth because their QB Cam Rising, Rising, or right, we'll say Cam Rising, yeah, he left the game after he suffered, like a, I guess they say it was a head injury, like a knock, a concussion. I guess you could say. Yeah, he got sacked, and that was it for him. His head hit the deck, and you got you got to put it in the backup. What's this guy's name? Bryson Barnes. Apparently he. He led a game tying touchdown drive in the final minutes before the game deciding field goal, which Ohio State won the game with. Rising finished the game with 214 passing passing and two touchdowns while also leading the Utes in rushing was 92 yards and a score. So interesting, interesting. Interesting turn of events. You had teams no one expected to be in this bowl game. And you got players playing out of their mind for a game they don't even get paid for. Interesting, interesting, interesting. But yeah, that was the Rose Bowl, which had a lot of highlights and big numbers posted. But now I'd just like to go back to... Where are we at? Back to the Cotton Bowl and the Orange Bowl. Actually, no, I'm lying. There was one more game, but I don't think no one really cared about this one because it was another... It's, it's Molly Wop of a game at the Sugar Bowl. Uh, Baylor, 21, Ole Miss, 7. That's it. That's all you got to know. That's all I'm going to cover because no one really – I don't think no one really cared about this game, honestly. I'm not even going to spend my time on this game because I didn't really hear much from it at all. So, yeah, I, I yeah, th- th- there's no point. <laughs> but I just wanted to get this – I wanted to talk about this more considering we had Michigan and Cincy. Cincinnati, the Bearcats, the Wolverines and the Bearcats never stood a chance to these two SEC giants. Uh, for Cincinnati, they were the first non-Power 5 conference team to participate in the in the eighth year uh, version, you could say, of the college football playoff era. And, you know, they, they suffered the same fate as every other team who went up against Alabama before them. Um, that th- that that tie defense just killed the Cincinnati QB. He only had 144 yards passing, and I was reading this stat earlier. I don't know how this makes any sense. He he finished the game with minus six yards rushing. What the hell? And you know, Bama historically in the Cotton Bowl by itself. Have a five and zero record at AT and T Stadium. They're eight and three overall in the CFP mark, sixty four and seven with a record against non SEC opponents, and seventy four and eight in non conference plus postseason games. So, I mean, if I would have known this before, I would have said, "Oh, it's, since he was a long shot." I mean, they were a long shot. What am I kidding? But this just is more definitive proof that Alabama in the playoffs are just an unstoppable beast. So, I mean, it's hard for me to under, not understand, but process that this Alabama team is just always for reals. 
And considering they weren't as dominant this season, and people still doubted them, and then now they're they're gonna go to where we're we going. We're going to Indianapolis for the national championship game, playing in the rematch of the SEC title game. Again, I guess you could say their new rival of newish rival Georgia, who also plays in SEC. To and same thing with Michigan's fate. Never stood a chance. Never stood a chance. What is this? Um, I have it written down. Georgia, Mar- Georgia literally marched 80 yards on his first possession of the game and never stopped in the first opening 30 minutes. It just killed them. You know, they, were, they were the first CFP, first team in college football playoff history to score points on the first five possessions. What the hell? You know, Michigan, to my knowledge, they had their moments, but they turned the ball over too many times in this game. Uh, accordingly, they had turned the ball over four straight possessions in the second and third quarters to immediately destroy any momentum. They tried to develop, tried to build. And to be more specific, they had two interceptions, a fumble, and they also turned the ball over once on downs. That's a recipe for disaster. I'm kind of glad I didn't watch this game either because I wouldn't be able to. <laughs> I'd be like, this game's over. These dude, they ne- Georgia destroyed them in the first 30 minutes. Dude, football games are like two and a half hours long, and you're telling me the game was over in 30 minutes. Like that's not even a game. That's like a scrimmage for Georgia. 30 minutes. Come on, Michigan. Come on, man. <sighs> Thanks, Michigan. So now, where are we at? <sighs> January 10th, on a Monday, National Championship game. Number one, Alabama, which is number three, Georgia. Both teams have a record of 13-1 and one coming into the game. And the last time they met, Alabama was victorious over Georgia in the SEC title game. Who will win this? I don't know, but I guess like every other basic sports person that follows college football, you're probably going to have to say Alabama, and I'm probably going to have to say Alabama. <sighs> Sigh. I guess. I really, I, I, I really don't. Like I told Daniel Tom in our last show a couple weeks ago, I don't. <laughs> this is not attractive to me. To someone who's watched these two teams play each other multiple times and seen Alabama play lots of times. So why does this catch my interest? It does not catch my interest at all. But as someone that follows sports, has been a journalist and a reporter, got to do it still. So we're we're fighting the urge. So I guess you want to know what makes these two teams good and what makes them what what makes them stand out for this game? So of course, Georgia wants to bounce back, considering their defense let them down in the SEC championship game. <sighs> Georgia surrendered, I believe, an average of six point nine points six point nine points during the regular season, and only gave up a whopping forty one point forty one points in the loss to. The Crimson Tide. Despite that game, the Bulldogs, the Bulldogs still ranked first in the nation with 9.5 points allowed per game as they bounce back with a 34-11 triumph over Michigan in the Orange Bowl, as previously stated. And I guess you could say their offense got back on track with that win because they put up 30 points. Because, actually, I can't even read my own notes. Blah, 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 blah. As the team produced... The team has produced at least 30 points for the 12th time in 13 contests. There we go. Got to get my groove back. Got to get my swagger back on. Uh, the Bulldogs... The, why do I keep saying the Bulldogs? What the hell is wrong with me? The Bulldogs are averaging 39 points to rank ninth in the country and haven't been held under 24 since their season opening 10-3 victory over Clemson. Uh, and their senior quarterback... Stenson Bennett has been racking up the touchdowns passes these last couple of games, who has thrown a total of 10 in the last three outings after recording 
only 12 over his previous nine games. For Alabama, this is their fifth in the nation in total offense with an average of 494.6 yards and are scoring 41.1 points per game to be ranked fourth. Prior to that win, to that 27 to 6 win over Cincinnati, they recorded 41 or more points in the in eight of 10 games and 10 of 13 overall in 2021. Alabama has been really successful running the ball against the Bearcats as they rack, as they have been racking up more than more yards on the ground, as they racked up more yards on the ground, 301 to Cincinnati's total offense of 218 yards. You gotta be kidding me. Here, sorry, it, it sounds a little mumbled, so let me put that in the better picture. They ran the ball for a total of 301 yards. Cincinnati in the Cotton Bowl overall passing passing and running only had 218. You got to be kidding me, man. So leave it down in the comments below if you're listening to this on YouTube or if you find us on Twitter and Instagram, let us know who you think is going to win this game. We'll probably leave a poll up somewhere on Twitter and Instagram to see who you guys think is going to win the national championship game, which is on January 10th. It's a Monday. So be prepared for that matchup. Um, if both teams played the way they did against these opponents, I want to say formidable opponents, but I can't. I'm not even going to lie to myself. If I'll just say this. If Georgia really wants to beat Alabama, they're going to have to pull all the stops. This will not be an easy game. So if you're interested in watching this game on January 10th, the Monday, you can find the game on ESPN at 8 p.m. Eastern. So what is that, like 5 p.m. here on the West Coast? So yeah, make sure you're glued to your television or follow us on Twitter for your updates on this game. So yeah, that was the college football portion of our tackle football extravaganza of the new year. So who's ready? Are you ready for some football? Or actually, some more football, I should say. As now, second main topic of the podcast, we'll be diving into some pro football with some NFL who, you know, they got one more week to go currently if you're listening to this. And, hey amen, playoff spots are starting to disappear very, very quickly. And to be honest, I haven't, Similar to college football, I haven't followed as much except for my own team, which is the Saints, which still alive somehow, some way. But I'm just glad you're telling me there's a chance. <laughs> but yeah, um, just looking like at the playoff picture and who's in first, like I'm pretty shocked at who's who's the top top dog of the league and who's coming up the rear. Because if you would have told me these two teams would have been in first place in their respective conferences, I would be like, one team, I would have been like, okay, kind of makes sense. And the other team, I would be like, all right, there's no way. Y'all yanking my chain. As Danny Tan would say, you're joshing me, bro. Because none of this makes any sense. And I've been hearing people say this is like the best, best NFL season in a while. I don't know if it's just because like, People are just watching sports again, or people at the stadiums again. Like, oh, it's fun again. Oh, this is nice. Oh, let's go to a football game and get into a fight. Oh, how how interesting. Oh, let's go watch a fight. Like, all right, are you here to watch the game or what's up? Like, oh, this is entertaining. Oh, let's watch sports. Oh, look, a home run. Wait, what? <laughs> but yeah, I mean, that's why I'm just venting what I've been seeing on the socials. Like, people have been saying like. This past season has been interesting. It's been entertaining because, you know, games getting rescheduled, guys missing games. So it's been a top, top and terzy season for everybody. But enough of my yapping. Let's get right into it. In the NFC, there is one playoff berth available. 
And we have, what do we got? One, two, three, four, five. Yeah, the six teams in here. Number one, the number one team in the league, which people were already counting out after week one when they got whooped by my Saints, the Green Bay Packers being carried on the back of Mr. I'm not getting a shot, Aaron Rodgers. And it's just remarkable that after people speculating and not even speculating, straight out, like, confirming he was not coming back, Aaron Rodgers has carried this Packers team to the number one seed at NFC and the number one team in the league. Because they've wrapped up not just the playoff spot, but, of course, number one in the conference, so first-round bye. The Packers have, have just gotten it done. The, the record's 13-3. and three. You know, you, you're good. You're chilling. I highly doubt he's going to play their next game. So you're going to get a fresh Aaron Rodgers, who virtually has no backup on the team considering that's the one of the reasons why he he was a, so he was allegedly about to leave i want to say he was about to leave but apparently that's not true no more cuz he's here duh so it's just remarkable that everybody thought that he was done and dusted that the team was done and dusted but they've somehow found the i want to say day i want to say just aaron rodgers has somehow found the way to hold it down for the same i mean i feel like the one good offensive threat he has is Devontae adams out, out there on the out there on the field so i mean it, it's just the one guy but hey when you're like an elite quarterback and you got two minutes to spare anything is possible you can just throw down throw the ball down to the field and you know your guy's gonna get it so that's how dominant this team has been all season long to my knowledge the second best team in the NFC right now is the Bucks, being led by Mr. Tom Brady, of course, of all people. And he've had he's had lots lots of weapons. Some of them, some of them gotten hurt. Some of them left during the middle of a game. But hey, <laughs> he's still Tom Brady. So it, I wouldn't say it's over for him. I feel the the Bucks as well. What, what's the record? Twelve and twelve and four at the moment. And I don't see this team stopping anytime soon. Considering they already, they did win the division, they won the NFC South. The only other team alive is is the Saints in the division. And even losing offensive offensive weapons, they they still find ways to win. Like this past week, they, they they were down big against the Jets, and you know the Jets had the chance to win the game. You know they just blew it on a fourth down, fourth and goal run, turned the ball over with like a minute left, and of course, Tom Brady, being Tom Brady, led the team down down the field and got got the dub. Because, yeah, it was all Jets in this game. Because in the first quarter for the Bucks, they had the one touchdown, then they had the field goal in the second, then they had the touchdown in the third, and then they were able to get four points in the fourth, in which New York, all they had to do was score one touchdown in that fourth, and they probably would have wrapped it up, but they just couldn't do it. It was kind of like their average. They were averaging about seven point something points in the game. <laughs> and up until the fourth, when he got goose egged, they just blew it. Another team that also clinched to their vision were Mr. Dallas Cowboy Town. How about them Cowboys? Damn Cowboys. They've been a thorn in my spine for years. It's just something, I guess, I don't know. Is it just that they're supposed to be America's team or that America hates them? What what is it going to be? I need someone to explain. Like, 
what makes the Dallas Cowboys the Cowboys? I mean, Dak Prescott has been playing lights out football this whole season. And, you know, this, I mean, yeah, I'm, I'm changing my tune considering, like, you know, like, they, he, similar to, I guess you could say, Aaron Rodgers, like, he has not let up, he has not let this team down this year. I could say that. Considering, you know, he got hurt, Ezekiel got hurt. People thought this, this team was done. But no, they're not done. They're, they're holding it down. Okay, let me see. Let me see your numbers, bro. Yeah, just in 2021 passing, he's had 569 attempts, 389 completions. His percentage is at 68.37. He's thrown 4,154 yards. He averages 7.3. His longest is 51 yards. And he's thrown 32 TD passes in comparison to his 10 interceptions. I believe his QBR is pretty at 100. Or at least his completion rating is at 100. I don't know. No, yeah, I think it's his QBR, yeah. Like, damn, like, you can't, you can't say that he sucks. So the Cowboys, good on them, clinching the division, getting to where everyone thinks they should be. Coming up, running up the rear in the playoffs, already clinching the spot, are the LA Rams, who after giving up their quarterback to the Lions, are, are now in a position once again to reach the Super Bowl, if possible. What was it the year they played Tom Brady in that boring ass Super Bowl with bum ass Maroon Five that uh, at the halftime, like bruh, like this was boring. But you know, with the new quarterback at the helm, with Mister Matthew Stafford, they've kind of turned it around. Uh, Stafford has four thousand six hundred forty eight yards rushing for the Rams, as Sony Michelle was eight hundred two yards. Uh, their best receiver, Cooper Cup. 1,082 nine yards. And right now, the currently their best tacker is Mr. Jordan Fuller was 107. And, you know, paying attention with the tip drills with leading in interceptions, Jalen Ramsey was three interceptions for the team. So I know I keep saying it, but good on the Rams for getting there, getting to where they should, clinching the spot, punching their ticket, I guess you could say. Continuing on and continuing on in the NFC, we also have the Cardinals who started out very, very hot, but have I guess you could say disappeared as of late. Considering they had they had to beat the Cowboys this past weekend, it just to stay a lot. Well, actually, no, yeah, I think they had to punch a ticket to beat the Cowboys. And you know, everyone thought they were going to go undefeated and all that jazz, but no, they just kind of kind of reverted back to the old Cardinals and disappeared for a while. But hey, looking up the, the, the stats and info, they're in the playoffs. And look who we have here next up clinching a spot to the playoffs, the Philadelphia Eagles. The Eagles, another team that no one has kind of paid attention to after their Super Bowl win. Uh, you know, was, was Jalen Hurts at the wheel? They've done pretty well for themselves. So good on them. In the hunt, still, somehow, some way, this team just has not died. It's the San Francisco 49ers. It's like, <laughs> I thought you guys were done and dusted. Like, how are you guys still here? How are you still alive? It makes no sense. But if they want a shot, to at least play in a wild card game, they still got to do a lot of jumping around. So for the Niners, in order to clinch a playoff berth, they could either one, win or tie, or two, New Orleans loses or ties. So it's still somewhat in the air for them. And 
not in the hunts, but on the bubble, they need two things to happen. And I hate to say this, the New Orleans Saints, my Saints, man. Ah, oh, man, on the cusp of greatness, but I always fall so, so short. <sighs> the Saints must win and have the Niners lose. So just to give you guys more context, the Niners are going to be going to LA and playing the Rams, and the Saints are going to be going to Atlanta, who I believe they lost to earlier in the season, and be playing them in an afternoon game there. So if you got your NFL ticket or NFL red zone, make sure you're paying attention to these games. Because it's going to be very, very dicey. And also just to let you guys know, um, so the Cardinals and the Rams are in, but the division is still up for grabs. So sorry, I guess I skipped this part of my notes. I don't know why. <laughs> the Cardinals, in order to win the NFC West, have to win and have the Rams lose. And the Rams to win the West need a win near A, win or tie, or second option, Arizona loses or ties. So that's how the NFC will be wrapped up because there's only one spot left and there's not there's only two teams in the running for that last spot. So it's I guess you could say simplified considering I would say they're probably the NFC is the better conference in the NFL right now. Because there's no way you're going to beat the Packers. The Bucks are really good. The Cowboys have been on one. You know, the Cardinals were mostly good all season. The Eagles are just a tough, tough team to play. Considering, like, their defense always shows up. Always shows up to play. So I highly doubt that any AFC team could match up in the conference right now. And speaking of the AFC, they have two playoff berths available. And I know when I started this segment, I mentioned that second team that I wouldn't believe be number one in the conference. And that team is the Tennessee Titans, who have clinched their division. The, the, the Tennessee Titans clinched, yeah, you're not hearing me wrong, clinched the AFC South division title. Which, if you would have told me in the beginning of the season, I would be like, dude, you're crazy. Like, the Titans? The Titans. I'm like, dude, you're wild. I know they had, what is his name? Derrick Henry. He got injured. But hey, guess what? The Titans just took him off of the injury list, and he might be available. So you're telling me if this team that 11-5 record, playing really, really well, I mean, out, I mean, uncommonly well, <laughs> Might have like their best offensive weapon in their in their back pocket, possibly ready to to go. Dude, that's huge. There's no way. I mean, if if you have all your all your weapons, like there's no way it's it's your race to lose. It's your race to lose. Second team in the AFC currently. You have the Kansas City Chiefs with Mr. Patrick Mahomes, who have also had an up and down season, which I believe they're they're that that one team that fell to the Packers <laughs> in the last dying moments of the game. Like, oops. Correct me if I'm wrong. Because I don't know. I, I want to say Kansas City is a good team. But I don't know. Ever since they lost to the Bucks, it's they kind it's kind of left a sour taste in my mouth. Because you guys are this really good team, and somehow, some way, you blew it. Like, I, I I thought, I thought I thought you guys were good. I thought, I thought you guys were. We're, we're going to show everybody that you guys are the best teams, best team in the country. Oh, I am wrong. I'm looking it up right now. No, actually, the Packers lost to Kansas City. My bad. That's when they had the backup. Oops. Wrong team. But as I was saying, I, I believe Kansas City is better than what the record shows. 
And then that happens sometimes where you guys are a better team and in the regular season, it just doesn't happen up until the playoffs and you get to the final and then you show everybody that, hey, we won. I mean, hopefully I'm proven, hopefully I'm proven right and the Chiefs get it together going into the playoffs because you know, they already cleansed the division. They're already home, they're already on their way. So, you know, just keep your guys healthy, stay safe, and play some damn football. The third team that clinched their division, and it's a little bit of a shocker, the Cincinnati Bengals. <sighs> man, Cincinnati. You got to be kidding me. This team, man, this team. You guys had a OG USC quarterback holding it down. You guys get Andy Dalton. Now, who you guys got? You guys got, what's his name? Joe Burrow, Mr. Cigar Man. Like, this, this guy who, who bust, literally busted his body for this team, he's, he's just been getting it done. And, you know, he, he's played, like, a MVP this whole season. So, so it's just it's just good on them that they were that he and the team was able to recover and that he has a chance to get them to the promised land. It's remarkable. Next up in the AFC, we have another team that people I mean a, a team that should be where they are right now. And that's the Buffalo Bills. Was what's his name? I was about to say Jared Allen. <laughs> I don't think it's Jared Gallen. Let me double check that. We're gonna get the rambling, rambling runoff crew. Can someone uh double check our stats? Because this is where having a co-host comes in handy. But when when you're when you're by yourself, it gets a little difficult. Let me find out. It is Jared Allen. Oh, Josh Allen. There we go. I, I'm i just a dummy. <laughs> hey, man. Like I said in the beginning, man. Got a new job. Schedule's all out of whack. It's kind of hard to follow NFL right now. Kind of hard to follow these games. But, yes, just continue on. Bills are in first. Josh Allen, you know, started out very slow in comparison to other quarterbacks that were drafted with him. But hey, he, he's gotten it all together. The Bills have gotten it all together. Currently, uh, Allen has attempted 601 passes. He's completed three, 385. 385. He has a percent, completion of a percentage of 64.1. Uh, that's for a total of 4,168 yards. He averages 6.9 a game. Uh, his, the longest he's thrown is a 61 yarder. He has 34 TDs and he's thrown 15 picks. I think he's been sacked. If I'm reading this correctly, 26 times. Yeah. So, and I think he has a 92.8 QBR, which is pretty good in comparison to uh, Dak Prescott's that I mentioned earlier. So, the Bills also in the playoff hunt. And another team that I wouldn't believe you that said I was going to be in the playoffs, these damn Patriots. Mr. Mac Jones and Mr. Belichick. An odd duo of names to say out loud, but somehow, some way, they still end up coming out of my mouth and in front of my computer and on my TV screen and out and about in the world. They're currently second in the AFC and clinched the playoff spot at a record in eight and eight. They played the Dolphins last week, this past weekend. And the Dolphins are... They're not a bad team. I mean, they're a good team considering they barely got eliminated from playoff contention and they had started very, very slow. They lost most of their games in the beginning of the season. So I guess, again, just like the Cowboys, like, gosh, like, why you guys got to do this to me? And like I, I mentioned before, the AFC is just a tad bit more confusing as. In the hunt still for the AFC, we got the Colts, 
and the Chargers. I know nothing about the Colts, and the Chargers have been up and down all season. They got a record. Both teams have a record of nine and seven. They're second in their division. So let's see what happens. I believe the Colts are going to be playing the Jags, who have not won in Jacksonville since like 2014. So let's see if they could do it and, you know, punch their ticket in. Because let me see. Let me double check their their odds. Da, 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 da. Let me see. Mm. Here we go. Indianapolis Colts. The Indianapolis Colts clinch a playoff berth with number one, an Indianapolis win or tie, or a Chargers loss plus a Baltimore pit tie, or a Chargers loss plus a pit loss plus a Miami win. The other team in the chase, the Chargers, let me see, what do you guys got to do? Chargers, 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 where you at? Too many notes, too many notes, too many notes. There we go. LA Chargers in the hunt. The Los Angeles Chargers clinch a playoff berth with one a win or a tie. Dang, that sucks. I mean, it's their own destiny. You can control it. It's I guess you could say it's a little more easier than what the Colts have to go through. And in the, or actually I should say now, on the bubble, we got the Steelers, the Ravens, and the Raiders. The silver and black, as my old friend Jeremy would like to say. What do we got here? The Pittsburgh Steelers clinch a playoff berth with a Pittsburgh win plus an Indianapolis loss plus, plus the Vegas Oh, excuse me. Plus the Raiders and Chargers game not ending in a tie. <laughs> Cause I think what it is, if actually I'll get to it in a bit. Yeah. Yeah, because if the Chargers are in, if they win or tie. <laughs> what? <laughs> yeah, and then next to them, we have where are you guys at my notes? Uh why why did I scatter it? Why did I do this to myself? The Ravens were also on the bubble, they get into the playoffs with a win, a Chargers loss, plus an Indianapolis loss, plus a Miami loss or tie. Like it's only one option, but it's still a lot of steps to get through. And for the Las Vegas Raiders, where are you guys at? They could get into the playoffs with a win or a tie plus the Indy loss, or an Indy loss, plus the Pittsburgh loss or tie. Man, what? I remember there was not a lot of ties a couple years ago. Now there's ties again. I think it's just because they get tired and they're like, oh, okay, we're just going to tie. Which, spoiler alert, the Rams, no, not the Rams, excuse me, wrong team. The Chargers and the Raiders could just blow this game off. I don't mean like cancel the game, but they could play it easy have the game tied for most of it, and, and then just be on their way. Because why are you going to put in so much effort? Why are you going to put in so much effort to do something and then not have, you know, it's, it's just the easy way out. Because then that way, you don't have to play your starters, both teams, and you'll just... It's escape, I guess, in a way. You can avoid the inevitable. Because both teams will get what they want, even if they tie. Which is very, very interesting. And considering everyone thought the Raiders were going to be really, really good. I mean, they were okay in the beginning. They just, they had to get the monkey off the back. You know, the, you, you lose your head coach. You, you lose your offensive threat. You lose a lot of players. And just in general... Your QBs come goes in up and down. He, he probably still were coming from an injury, Loki. But hey, they did what they had to do, and they got the job done. Or they're getting the job done. They want to get the job done. It's not done yet. And I, I've listed all the teams that that are in or have a chance. But what about the teams that didn't make the playoffs? I already mentioned one of them pretty briefly. One of those teams that everyone thought was going to make it was the Browns, which, oopsie-doopsie, you're gone. And the Dolphins, who, 
you know, they had that win against New Orleans about a week or two ago on Monday Night Football. And, you know, this week they, they had to keep winning. They, they could not lose. And, you know, unfortunately they, they fell to, to the Pats. So it comes down to you guys, our listeners. Who do you think is going to make it? And who do you think has been playing well? And tell me else, tell me something, one more thing. Who has surprised you? And yeah, I mean, that's it. Hit us up on Twitter at Off Rambling. Or if you're watching us on YouTube, uh, leave a comment below. Because, yeah, my surprise is the Titans. Like, what? (laughs) The Titans are in first place of the AFC. I don't believe it. I can't believe it. It's astonishing, honestly, to me. And moving on in our programming, we're now going into the warm-up. And I would just like to say, like I meant, I know we said in the beginning of the show, um, I'm just going to go over, I guess, a couple of a quick moments, a couple of moments that I guess you could say shaped my, or how do I explain this? I just want to go over some holiday highlights from my childhood that, you know, during like these, I guess you could say two week breaks from school as a kid, you know, that I just remember just for no reason. And I wish Daniel or, or Daniel were here to, I guess, put in their two cents, but I think mine are pretty decent. I have a few. So uh, first off, one of my earliest memories of Christmas, NBA Christmas games, was between the Lakers and the Heat. I don't remember what year it was, but it was like right after Shaq left, and he went down to Miami. It was like a big deal because it was like Kobe versus Shaq and, you know, their acquaintance relationship that they had there for a while where, you know, one wanted the ball, and then – the other one couldn't. It was just one big cluster of of personalities, you know, trying to get what they want in the game or out of the team. And I don't even remember who won. I just remember I was at my grandparents' house and we were all watching the game. Like, it was this whole big deal. Because it was a big deal at the time because Shaq in Miami, not wearing purple and gold, you know, they, they both wanted to prove that they could do it on their own and not rely on, the, on each other. So, I mean, I remember that. Um, oh, I also remember um, going to my cousin's house. Actually, not naming winter break. It was, this was a Thanksgiving win, actually. I'm going off, off the script. Uh, watching those dumb cowboy games every Thanksgiving. And there was one Thanksgiving where we went to a relative's house. And this relative lived, like, on an uphill slash downhill street. So, they live on a hill. And for some reason, we were still trying to play tackle football slash two-hand touch going up and down, like, the street. (laughs) And I remember at some point, I was playing, I don't know, I was playing, like, a lot. I think we were playing, like, 4v4 or something. And at some point, we had had one person rushing. And at some point, I got to rush. (laughs) I was chasing whoever was playing the quarterback, and I got my my fingers stuck in their shirt and when they moved my finger bent backward like it kind of (laughs) hurt but I was like whatever and then just little by little I felt my hand with my finger was hurting and I was like what the hell's going on I could see my 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 finger wasn't broken but it was turning purple and I was like oh I bruised my finger (laughs) and so I finally got home and some relatives were still around and they're like, oh, let me see your finger. And I just bend it backwards. And I'm just screaming in pain, like, ow, that hurt. And they're like, oh, well, if you think that's hurt, guess we're going to have to do. I'm like, what? We're going to have to put it in ice. I was like, bruh. So yeah, I put my hand in like a red solo cup full of ice. And dude, yeah, it was Thanksgiving, but it was in the nighttime. And it was still cold as hell. And yeah, putting your hand in a cro- in a Cold cup of water with ice is not fun at all. I remember that. Um, I remember also it's similar to watching the Cowboys games. There was also uh well, I mean, I already mentioned it before, but you know, watching the Laker games, and I remember that I think it might have been 2009, 2010, maybe you have 11. Uh this is when LeBron was still with the Cavs. I don't think Kobe played that year because people were we're really hyped over a Lakers v Cavs game on Christmas in which, you know, 
that was around that time i think it had to be because i was around i think around the time when all those like commercials with the the kobe and lebron puppets were on because i think it was 2009 2010 where everyone thought the Cavs were going to make it to the nba finals and it was going to be lebron versus kobe in the finals but the Cavs couldn't beat the magic with the white at that time who were just unstoppable so instead of lebron v kobe we got kobe v dwight and i remember those commercials vividly because I know a lot of people were upset that there, that one of the guys wasn't playing, and who and people got more upset if you were at the game because the Cavs just destroyed the Lakers. And I only remember this specifically because I think they gave away foam fingers that day, and and I think there was a bad call going against the Lakers, and everyone was just upset, and they started throwing the foam fingers onto the floor. And I remember they had zoomed out, and you just see a, a whole bunch of foam fingers being thrown out onto the, onto the court, and the an announcer having going, please do not throw the foam fingers onto the floor. Daniel Tom, if you're listening, you need to tell me who's the the Laker announcer during the games. And he was like, please do not throw objects onto the floor. Please, please do not throw items onto the court. Anyway, everyone's throwing shit. And they're booing. I mean, because the game was over. Because there is no way to... I remember they just got destroyed that Christmas. So, <laughs> I remember telling my relatives, they're like, oh my gosh, like, how ridiculous. I mean, it is ridiculous, but it's still pretty funny to think about that. They're throwing foam fingers onto the court. So, <laughs> I don't know. It's just a goofy memory of mine that I have from my childhood. Um, I'm trying to think. Oh, there's that other... Oh, yeah, this one's a Christmas one. Another Christmas one. And soccer. So, Liga MX, the Mexican Soccer League, they play in the fall and they play in, like, the spring. So, their fall season basically ends in the winter. And I remember this year, we did Christmas on Christmas Eve, and I totally forgot that they were playing their final, which is... I don't know if, if you guys were paying attention to one of our last episodes. They played two games in which the first game was played before, right before Christmas, and was earlier in the week and then the second game was going to play on Christmas Eve and yeah packed house it was featuring Tigres and America you know two juggernaut two juggernauts in the Mexican soccer landscape and Tigres defeating America in penalties on Christmas Eve to win the final and the only reason why I bring this one up is because I think I just ran into went to my room I turned my TV on and no, I was on Twitter. Someone tweeted out that America was playing. I was like, wait, what? It's Christmas Eve. America can't be playing. How's that even possible? So I went to my room and they're like, oh, they're going into overtime. I was like, wait, what? So I turned my TV on and they were already in penalties. And I think America had gone up and they had missed their next few. And then they guys took advantage of making theirs and they were able to be the champions. And yeah. <laughs> Another, I guess, holiday time memory that I have from this time, uh, like I mentioned before, I'm a big USC guy, and well, at least I used to be, I guess you could say. I, I mean, I still like USC, but I'm, I don't obsess as over them as I used to, as I was as a kid, because this is the reason why I'm bringing this one up. USC versus Penn State in two thousand for the 2009 Rose Bowl game. I remember that was a big deal, because Penn State was really good, USC was just unstoppable. Unstoppable. Because I remember they destroyed Penn State. They destroyed them. They never stood a chance. Never stood a chance. Okay, I remember, I think I went to my cousin's house. And we went to go watch the game. And yeah, it was a... It was a good game. I mean... They destroyed them. It was USC scored 24 unanswered points. Because <laughs> the game ended uh 38 to 24. I remember thinking that Penn State was actually gonna come back. <laughs> I was so I don't know, that's how like paranoid I was watching these games because I, I don't know, I just didn't want to see USC lose. And yeah, oh yeah, Mark Sanchez was the QB. Damn, throwback. Who was a defensive player of the of, Kaluka Mayavea. 
Maeva? Dang, I do not remember him. Was Troy Palomola on this team? Dang, I do not remember. <laughs> it's been so long. He was not on this team. Oh, dang, I'm trying to remember who, the, who that guy was. Dang, I hate myself right now. I can't remember. It's on the tip of my tongue. It's some other Hawaiian Samoan player at the time who was really good. It might have been him, but it's just not coming to me at the moment. But this one's a two-for-one because, you know, I think this was one of the last times USC went to the Rose Bowl. And, that yeah, Oh, apparently on, on where I'm looking it up, this was the 95th edition of the Rose Bowl game. Interesting, interesting. And the other Rose Bowl game, I would like to, to make note of it, the recent one that USC won against Penn State, a, a very good Penn State team, a different Penn State team. Dude, 2017, man. Damn, like, I remember that shit like it was yesterday. You know, the, the big fire jet, the big fire jet flies over the stadium. And then I hear... I'm like, what the hell is that noise? Dude, it was the fighter jet flying over my house. I was like, damn, it's flying low. It's it's huge. And then, you know, the game starts. Penn State scores first. I'm like, damn it. But you see, USC responds back even after they, their, their kicker missed a field goal. I'm like, man, is this going to be it? Is this how these past 10 years have jumbled up? We've played good this whole time. We're just going to choke it. It's like, no, it can't be. And somehow, some way, USC found a way with Sam Darnold at the helm. You know, I think what they I think they had Buck Allen still in the backfield running the ball. Like, oh man. And to top it off, I cried. <laughs> I don't give a damn. I cried tears of joy. Almost waiting 10 damn years. 10 damn years. What the hell? Like, I'm like losing it. I'm talking to myself. Do you know how hard it is to wait almost 10 years for your team to be relevant again? 10, I mean, the, the, the Chicago Cubs had to wait 100 years. I don't give a damn. I had to wait 10 years for these guys to not just be relevant, but I had to wait for them to be bowl eligible. I had to wait for them to get decent players on the team i had to wait for them to break into the to even be spoken into college football playoff like notoriety and oh man who was oh i think it was deontay burnett he scored three touchdowns in that game a hat trick oh man it was such a good game i remember usc had to come back and yeah they won it with like two a couple seconds left off a field goal and I remember the game basically ending, or the game ending for Pittsburgh. <laughs> the game ending for Penn State when they tried running the same play twice. They're trying to go for a long ball play, and they almost got picked off. And then they run the same play again, and it gets picked off. It's like, what were you guys thinking? What is going on? <laughs> like, damn. Running the same play, and the guy almost ran it back for the game-winning touchdown. Dude, that would have been some shit right there, dude. Like, damn, a pick six to win the game. Gosh, dude, I'm just I'm getting emotional thinking about it. Gosh. Like, damn. <laughs> oh, man, dude. If I could just go back to that one day sitting in my room watching the game, dude. And that shit was... Oh, man, it was good. It was perfect. Perfect. New Year's Day Rose Bowl game, man. I couldn't have it any other way. Oh, but uh, yeah, I think that's a uh, that, that that's it on on the warm up and my holiday look back because I'm this will be the last time for holiday talk. I think because New Year's is over, Christmas time is over, things gobble gobble time is over. So yeah, and to close it out as always, we got the rundown. Just go over some some news headlines that we that we might have missed over the past week or two. Um, the president of FIFA he is really adamant of having a two year World Cup plan. Like, why would you do that? Why would you want to have the World Cup every two years? Like, I don't, I, I don't. It doesn't make sense to me because, like. It's already going to get diluted because we're adding more teams to the tournament. And now you're telling me that you want to have it every two years. Like, players are going to get more rundown. 
you know, the sport might even be diluted itself because it's just going to be games all the time. Like, I mean, they play a lot of soccer anyway, but you're adding more and more time to a sport that, you know, you play week in and week out. So, I I mean, his explanation is that the youth or the kids need to see more soccer. Like, what are you talking about? It's the most popular sport in the world, and you want to play it more than it already is being played? Like, is it just because other regions of the world just haven't been catching up? Like, why don't you just fix those regions then? Like, Europe is fine. The Amer- Both North and South America are fine. Even, dude, South America is solid. North America, you know, they're catching up. Mexico's always been holding it down. The U.S. is coming. Canada's coming up the rear, finally, with their team, with their league, even. So it's ridiculous that, you know, I mean, the only reasons I could think that would need help would be, like, the Asian Pacific, the Oceanic Pacific, you know, like, I guess parts of the Middle East, like, dude, like, why don't you just fix those places then? Like, you're going to tell me that the kids need more soccer? Like, kids are not into soccer. Dude, you're, you're tripping, dude. Like, I don't know what he's talking about. People just like the sport. It's just emotional. It's dramatic. So, to play more soccer is, uh, I don't know, I, I'm not feeling it. And now, supposedly, he's he's seeing if the, the Euros would want to be every two years. Like, what? Come on, man. <laughs> You can only pick one. Pick your poison. Another thing we got in the rundown, we got Mr. Mono Ginobili. He is one of the headlining names in the NBA Hall of Fame induction process right now. So, hey, Mono played really, really well during his time in the NBA. Uh, I believe he, he, he mostly just played for the Spurs. So, good on him. You know, possibly being inducted into the um the NBA Hall of Fame. Cause hey man, that, that's a big deal. And I mean considering now like how basketball is like so grounded and not just in mainstream but just overall culture. Cause he he he's Argentine there's not a lot of Argentinian guys in the NBA. And considering his his career average of 13 points, 3.8 assists, 44.7 field goal, 40, 40, 36.9 field goal from three, free throws 82%. You know, he had he averaged 3.5 rebounds a game. He played 1,057 games. And I believe that was all for San Antonio. What a hell of a career. So good on him for you know holding it down let me see he was playing since like 1999 he started playing with san antonio in 2002 2003 you gotta be kidding me so how many seasons is that one two three four five six seven eight nine ten eleven twelve thirteen fourteen fifteen six excuse me 16 seasons with the spurs and the nba that's crazy. And did I say Mon Ginobili is, is Argentinian? Am I wrong on that? Let me see. No, yeah. I think he's Argentinian. Yeah, Argentinian. But apparently he played in Italy for a hot minute. Interesting, interesting, interesting. He's 44 years old. Nice. Oh, yeah. NBA draft, 1999. Round two. He was picked number 57. Cool. Uh, and other news, no, nothing has changed on the MLB lockout. This is moving very slow. But what I think is happening now, people are getting a little worried because there hasn't been no progress. I mean, I guess it's just convenient because baseball takes long. So I guess this is going to take long too. So, yeah, it is what it is. Uh, and pro wrestling news, AEW has now officially moved to TBS. As of January. So if you're a wrestling guy like myself who has fallen back into the pro wrestling world, go check out some AEW on TBS. It's fun. And if you like WE, Brock Lesnar is a champ again. Whoop de doo. Yay. Um, 
Wait, is what do I hear? What do I hear coming down the way? Oh, March is coming. Ah, nice. And when March is coming, March Madness is coming. So I would just like to give a quick shout out to College Football AP Top 25, which, you know, every week it's always changing. And I bring it up because, hey, man, we love a good college basketball tournament, March Madness. Keep a lookout because as of this recording, we're in the first week of January. We got basically two months, a month if you want, before March Madness arrives. So make sure you start getting mentally prepared for your brackets to bust. And the last thing I would like to just point out in the rundown is that NASCAR will be returning to California at the LA Memorial Coliseum on February 6th. So somehow, some way, in the Coliseum, where they play football, soccer, lacrosse, and recently had a Drake and Kanye concert, they're going to have vehicles that can reach almost 200 miles per hour on a very small track in the Coliseum. This doesn't make any sense, but they're going to do it. I mean, they have the small track. I think, is it the Monster Mile? No, it's not the Monster Mile. I'm forgetting the name of the race track because I used to watch NASCAR when I was a kid. But it's it's going to be very odd configuration because it's a sm- it's going to be a small track, which is not new, but it's rare because it's happening at the Coliseum. Two, whenever you have races at the small tracks, there's a lot of crashes, and you have to race a little bit differently. And three, I I, I need to see it <laughs> with my own eyes on at least television, because the only time I, the only when I was researching this, they've only ever had like dirt cars kinda, and they put pavement, but it was a different track format, and it's different vehicles. And also, the only other time they had racing there was uh, when they had the X Games. They had rally car. Or rally cross, if you whatever you want to call it, the rally car racing. But that was different. That was on dirt, and they were able to have the cars go in and out of the, the racetrack, or in and out of the stadium, I should say. So it was a different configuration, and they even had a jump. So I don't know how they're going to pull this off. <laughs> it's going to be very interesting to see all these cars just probably pile up, and then have them have to call out the other vehicles. Or the, what do you say, the the transportation vehicles to pull cars off the track and see where that goes. Because I don't even, they show like a digital version of it. I'm like, where are the pit stops going to be at? Is it going to, do you have to get off the track to go into the pit? Because usually the pits are in the middle of the, of the track. But it's going to be too small. And I even think the smallest track they have, like, it's already a tight squeeze. But we'll see how they figure it out. On February 6th at the LA Memorial Coliseum. I believe it's going to be on Fox, to my knowledge. But yeah, that's the rundown. That's everything we got. I am mentally exhausted. And I need some water because I forgot to bring a cup of water with me. I don't know why I didn't just pause any of this. <laughs> God, and so I'm by myself anyway. But uh, yeah, um, this was the Rambling Runoff. Uh, once again, like I've mentioned throughout the show, if you want to follow us on Twitter, you can at off rambling. If you want to follow us on Instagram, you can find us at rambling runoff. Um, if you're listening to this on whatever platform, thank you. Uh, yeah, we're on Spotify. Uh, I'm blanking out. Somehow, Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts. Um, I'm forgetting the other ones. <laughs> We're on YouTube. Thanks if you're on YouTube. Please leave a like and leave a comment below. It. I really appreciate it. No, really, I do. And yeah, just make sure you're following us on wherever we're at, I guess. I've been your host, Robert Rios. This was the Rambling Runoff. See you guys next time. Bye.